Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you and the UCL Lunch Hour Lecture Series. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Maxine Molineux, who is um, an expert from the UCL Institute of the Americas. Uh, Maxine has worked for the UN for a long time, and she's just finished a DFID-funded project on poverty in Latin America. And on the auspicious occasion of International Women's Day, she's going to talk to us about progress towards women's empowerment and gender equality in Latin America. So without further ado, Professor Molino. Well, thank you all very much for coming. And I'm really pleased that we can commemorate this historic day at UCL in celebration of women and that its message still resonates uh, more than a century since it was first proposed by the Russian revolutionary Clara Zetkin at the International Conference of Working Women in Copenhagen, a truly international birth. So it's appropriate that this year it provides us with an opportunity to look at what, in, what has happened in Latin America, what has Latin America achieved in regard to gender equality and women's rights, and particularly the role that international standard setting campaigns led by the UN can play in promoting them. My interest in these issues arises from many years of research and policy involvement in the area of women's human rights. Uh, the topic of my talk today will relate to one of my research interests, which is to think about what makes for effective international policy interventions in the area of women's rights, or if you like, what policy environments uh, produce positive results for women in developing countries? So in this talk, I'm going to look at how far the global campaign to promote the Millennium Development Goals has contributed to improving the situation of women in the Latin American region. And I'll be drawing a little on some of my recent research uh, in the Andean region and in Mexico, which looked at whether gender equality frameworks reached the very poorest and made a difference to the lives of very poor women living in rural communities. But I won't have much time to go into that in detail, so happy to talk about that later in the Q&A. So I'll begin by saying a few words about the Millennium Development Goals. Then I'll look at the Latin American region and its progress on MDG3, that is the goal on women. And I'll conclude with a discussion of where we are at with the setting of the post-2015 global agenda. So what are the MDGs, as they're called for short? What are the M Millennium Development Goals? How many people here have heard of them? Good, about a third, I'd say maybe, quarter. That's pretty good, actually, good audience. Because honestly, not many people have heard of them in this country because in a way they don't really have the same kind of impact in a country like the UK as they would do elsewhere in the global south. I don't suppose many of you know that David Cameron was on the UN Secretary General's high level task force for the MDG consultation. Well, he was. Um, he was, and he was there, and he participated in, in that process, and I'll be coming on to that a little bit later. Now, the MDGs were the goals set by the world's political leaders at the UN Millennium Summit in 2000. They were signed up to by all countries of the world, which then constituted 189 countries. And although they don't have a very high profile in the UK, as I said, uh, they have claimed quite an important impact um, in various parts of the world, and they are claimed uh, by uh, people who follow these things as the most important and comprehensive set of policy goals to have achieved a global consensus in recent decades. Some people even go so far as to say it's probably the first time that we can speak of a full global consensus of this kind. So they are pretty important in that sense because, as you know, a lot of these frameworks, a lot of these campaigns do not achieve a full global consensus, and that's one of the reasons they may not have very much effect. Okay, so here are the eight MDGs, the eight goals that were set at that conference in 2000. Uh, 
Now, all the countries that signed up to it committed themselves to meet the goals by 2015. Um, and there are some uh, people, of course, you know, many perhaps even here, who doubt that international campaigns and policy frameworks of this kind can make a real impact on the ground, that they look good, that they, there's a big fanfare about them, but do they really reach uh, the people who matter? And there is some reason for that skepticism. Um, it is, after all, governments, governments that have to implement these uh, goals, have to come up with ways to make them effective. They have to resource that implementation. And um, they can all too often uh, just prefer to ignore them or perhaps dilute them or select a few of them that they will go with and ignore the rest. The MDG campaign uh, does, however, claim some significant uh, advances. Um, and perhaps it's worth just having a look at a couple of these. And of course, with a year to run, there's still a year to go before the target date of 2015, um, these successes are already claimed globally. And among them, and the main ones are that since 2000 has occurred the fastest reduction in poverty in history with half a billion fewer people living below an international poverty line of $1.25 a day. It's very little though, isn't it? We have to ask the question, what does it mean? But it's certainly something. Child death rates have fallen by at least 30% globally, with 3 million children or so, uh, lives being saved each year compared to 2000. And as you will all know, if you follow this campaign in Africa, the deaths from malaria have uh, fallen significantly um, by a quarter, particularly in Africa, and partly as a result of the famous nets that uh, were brought in to protect people from the mosquito, the Anopheles mosquito. So there are some significant gains which can be attributed to MDG impact, and these are measurable gains. Of course, there's lots of things we don't really know when we try to measure success. We don't know how it changes people's attitudes. We don't know um, why uh, some of the achievements were made. There's all sorts of factors that go in to uh, explaining these things. But it does certainly look as if there has been some impact. Now, in terms of poverty, um, of course, these figures, as I implied, you know, can be can be sort of taken, not exactly with a pinch of salt, but we have to sort of set them in context. Economic growth in China and India certainly contributed to, uh, to, con to that sort of figure of reducing poverty. Um, nonetheless, uh, in Latin America, it uh, wasn't so much that, but efforts that were made to reduce poverty, which again, I'll come on to in a moment. But as far as women's empowerment and gender equality, um, the evidence is very mixed, and by 2010, a lot of countries are falling well behind on the indicators. New targets were therefore set for gender equality, and greater efforts were made after a meeting in 2010. And um, much, some four years later, one can say that there has been a bit more progress, uh, so that it's again possible to say that at least in some countries, the MDGs have been quite important in highlighting women's rights and equality, which is an area of policy that has all too often been neglected or only very partially addressed. So why is it that international frameworks and campaigns might be effective? Well, first of all, there is the fact that they help to set policy priorities within a given time frame so that they are a stimulus to government action. Secondly, there's a funding question. Overseas aid or development money from the World Bank and the UN and from governments is, is channeled directly into meeting uh, these goals. And there has been quite a lot of buy-in, if you like, uh, to meeting these goals, so money has followed that buy-in. Thirdly, governments have a political incentive to meet them as they can claim success to their electorates if they make progress in achieving the goals. Conversely, they can be named and shamed in both national and international um, arenas or even on Twitter and the web and so forth if they don't meet them. And that can occur both at national level and international level. But certainly, naming and shaming is certainly 
part of the game. And uh, governments that do fail to meet the goals uh, fall far behind them, will be uh, duly brought up before the global tribunal, so to speak, of civil society. Fourthly, um, lobby groups, NGOs, donors, can all put pressure on countries to do better. And civil society organizations can mobilize to um, pressurize for policy implementation and for improvements. So for all of these reasons, these international standard setting campaigns, if they do get the kind of buy-in the MDGs got, they can be effective in creating the policy environment that brings about results. So let's have a look at the Latin American region from the vantage point of women. And I just make a few general points. Latin America is a very diverse region. Although it's a middle income country in terms of average economic indicators such as GDP or income per capita, its 20 countries vary greatly in size of economy, territory and population, as you can see here. We have some large industrialized countries at one end, such as Mexico, which joined the OECD in 94, and of course Brazil, which overtook the UK last year to occupy the sixth place in the list of the world's largest economies. These giants also coexist with some of the smallest and poorest countries in the world, such as Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala. Secondly, there is not only diversity among countries, but also within countries. Average figures, again, conceal very deep social and regional inequalities. Latin America has the highest Gini coefficient of any region of the world. And that means that inequalities are very deep. Uh, Latin America has six countries in the top 10 uh, in the world for income inequality. And in fact, inequality has become far more marked in recent decades. Income and wealth are sharply concentrated in the hands of a tiny percentage. And the lower 30% of the population get by on very low incomes. Now, this general story, of course, is one we're familiar um, with in global terms, and um, the global trends are uh, as shown on this slide. So we have got a, uh, an increasing concentration of wealth, and uh, at the other end, an increasing, uh, increasingly large number of people who, um, who are in poverty or in, um, in some precarious uh, state of livelihood. Now, as far as women are concerned, Latin America's diversity is also reflected in the gender equality, inequality uh, index rankings. And I'm taking the statistics for 2012 here. Um, and what we can see here, uh, the gender ranking takes a number of indicators, it's quite a complicated um, sort of calculation just to show, uh, you know, which countries have achieved the greatest ranking in terms of gender equality and which ones are falling behind. So you can see that, for example, the top performers in Latin America uh, start with Chile at around 40. Um, just for a comparison, the, the, the very top performers are actually um, Norway, Australia, the Netherlands, Germany. The UK is pretty far down, actually, at 26. Um, Latin America starts, as I said, in the 40s, but goes right up to 133, so you can you know, get a sense of that diversity, and particularly in regard to um, how women are positioned in these societies. And, uh, and I think that's, that is both at the kind of national level, but also at the kind of regional level. Poor people in Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, and Paraguay will be, um, will be very poor indeed. And the women within those um, uh, sort of, uh, that, 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 those kind of, poor regions will be very, very poorly off, as we'll see shortly. So despite this variation, um, on average indicators for gender inequality, Latin America is placed towards the upper middle rankings in regional comparisons of gender inequality. So it's obviously going to be above Africa, it's above the Middle East, and it's above Asia. But of course, as you'd expect, it's below Europe and the US. And Latin America is the region in the South that has, in fact, made the most progress in terms of women's rights in the last few decades. There are several reasons for this. The obvious one would seem to be economic. 
uh, Latin America is on average richer than some regions, parts of Africa, Asia, and so forth. And this should give governments more resources, in theory, to spend on policies that favor social advance, including women's rights. But this doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, GDP alone doesn't explain progress on gender issues. You only have to think of the Gulf countries of the Middle East, uh, which are far richer than Latin America, but fare far less well in terms of gender indicators. And likewise, there are some countries that are much poorer, but they can do rather better. Secondly, uh, very important for women is the birth rate. And it's a fairly reliable indicator of the potential for women to improve their situation, in particular, the fertility uh, level of a particular country. And um, we see, for example, that uh, in Latin America, the total fertility rate has fallen uh, quite dramatically. And uh, you can just about see, I hope, the red line, which shows Brazil at below replacement level and the average for Latin America at um, 2.27. So that does, um, that's a very important historic shift, and um, that uh, Latin America is in a demographic transition. It's expected that this uh, will continue over the next 20 years or so, but it obviously has uh, major implications for women. But it's interesting that it probably reflects the fact that more women are working and more women are educated rather than uh, reliable access to fertility control because of the restrictions that women face in Latin America um, in getting fertility access to fertility control in some contexts. Thirdly, political factors are also critically important, even decisive. These include the political will of governments, whether the policy environment favors rights agendas and especially women's rights, and whether the a uh, country is democratic, whether it has an active civil society and social movements that press for rights and reforms. And since the end of the period of military dictatorship 30 or so years ago, Latin America has been ruled by democratic governments, which in their majority have been left of center and committed to human rights. Uh, this is uh, sometimes called the pink tide, the sort of wave of left-wing governments that came in uh, and you may see some recognizable faces there, the now deceased Hugo Chavez on the right, and uh, Eva Morales to the second left, and so on. And it's important to point out, and referring back to Clara Zetkin's, um, in, you know, as it were, suggestion all those years ago, parties of the left have historically been more supportive of women's rights than those of the right, which have tended to align with the conservative churches on key issues affecting uh, policies on women. The fourth factor would be that Latin America has had a long, a long standing, um, well, let's say long period of engagement uh, with feminist movements and women's movements. And in recent times, um, women's movements and feminist movements were active in uh, the opposition to military dictatorships that grew in uh, strength throughout the years of democratic uh, consolidation, that women's movements started in opposition and gradually they became consolidated. During the period of democracy, many of them got into positions of power and uh, were able to effect policy changes. And uh, from the mid-1980s, Latin American women were also active in a global uh, women's movement that was growing up around a number of uh, UN agenda-setting conferences that took place, whether in Vienna, Copenhagen, or Beijing. And as a consequence, um, Latin American feminists who were participating in that brought back demands from that process and were able to press governments to incorporate, uh, if you like, dem uh, domesticate some of these frameworks in the new constitutions that the new left governments were bringing into force. So there were quite a lot of things that went on uh, prior to the advent of the MDGs that actually prepared the way, so to speak, for us to see that things in Latin America were already somewhat different by the time the Millennium Development Goals uh, were in place. So just to sum up on that point, Latin America from the mid-80s benefited from pretty favorable uh, political conditions and from sympathetic 
democratic governments um, which adopted international women's rights frameworks and uh, created a context in which um, implementation of those frameworks could begin to be part of the political agenda. The political context I've just described also favored the MDG campaigns. When it started in 2000, Latin America was undergoing a regional policy shift away from the market-oriented Washington consensus policies that had been in place for 20 or so years. Left governments made real efforts to tackle some long-standing social deficits and started to spend more money on social policies and poverty relief. So there was a convergence, if you like, between the Millennium Development Goals and what these governments wanted to do. Let's move on now to have a look at how Latin America's fared in meeting MDG 3, that is the goal to promote gender equality and empower women. Millennium Development Goals have goals and targets and indicators, and these are all very important. Uh, the goal is a general goal. The question is, how is it measured and what is taken as progress? So in this case, the target was to eradicate the gender gap in education. That was the first target. And um, the, the idea there was that it was a rather narrow goal, rather narrow target to aim for. And so there was um, a great deal of intense debate about uh, trying to extend these targets to include a broader field, because just focusing on one was simply not going to do enough. So a lot of lobbies in Latin America and elsewhere dissatisfied with this focus on just the one target and the, uh, the indicators, and eventually more indicators were added with two on education as here, uh, one on employment and one on political representation. So the Latin American region has done quite well with respect to meeting these four targets. Um, uh, and certainly by the time we get to 2015, uh, they can claim even more success. Um, these are, of course, very basic goals when it comes to women's empowerment, but uh, nonetheless, they're quite important ones. Just to run through them quickly, education. Um, on education, it's, of course, everywhere seen as a magic bullet. Um, and in terms to achieve progress for particular groups, and of course for women too, and uh, it it's, uh, helps women to take charge of their lives, improve their life chances, and so forth. But um, in Latin America, there were considerable efforts to improve girls' access to education. Certain incentives were provided, and so forth. And there has been significant progress in girls' enrollment in Latin America. So most countries have um, actually, on average figures, reversed the gender gap in education uh, girls have, in other words, caught up with boys and in some cases have overtaken them uh, in schools, both in terms of enrollment and also in terms, in many cases, not all, in terms of results. In fact, there's a new concern about boys and young men falling further behind and, uh, of course, high dropouts now of young men from school. So this has, in effect, been a reversal of the gender gap. Today in Latin America, the problem is not so much enrollment, but um, really a concern with the very poor quality of education. So Latin American countries are spending a lot of um, money to try to improve the quality of education, and that is probably why you're seeing quite a lot of Latin Americans traveling for their education abroad once they reach tertiary level. But the gender gap hasn't been reversed everywhere, and. Um, we do see that the old gender gap reappears with force once we move out of the urban centers and go to those poorer areas, the disadvantaged areas, um, where you see, again, women, young girls and young women being disadvantaged largely because of poverty. Girls uh, are often needed to help out at home. They drop out at school uh, on account of early marriage and increasingly early uh, pregnancy. This is a major problem developing now in Latin America. And of course, early pregnancy is actually quite dangerous um, and is one of the factors that can lead to very poor health, 
even to um, an early death, especially if the services aren't available to, um, to help with childbirth, safe childbirth. So that is another, uh, uh, as it were, let's say half-filled um, goal. The other indicator, illiteracy, um, has, um, has also been falling among young people. Young people now are attaining um, pretty much equal literacy levels, but of course it still persists amongst people over the age of 15, where in the countries which have got gender gaps in literacy, you can have a gap between 13 and 17 percent, as in Panama and Guatemala, respectively. So illiteracy is still a problem for women, and those women are likely to be the indigenous women, the poorer women uh, who uh, live in the rural areas. Despite these qualifications, there have been very clear improvements in the educational status of women, so that the point would be, if you want to do something about it, and you put the resources behind it, you can make a difference. We come to the third target, um, women's employment in the urban areas. This is supposed to be a sign of progress, but I think it's a very tricky indicator. Um, women have entered employment in ever-increasing numbers since the mid-80s, actually, in Latin America. And now women make up, on average, between 52% of the workforce, um, with Cuba and Chile uh, 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 with the lowest rates. Uh, so you have the average of 52%, and uh, you have um, very low rates in countries like uh, Cuba, surprisingly, because Cuba used to have much higher rates. But um, we, they're now around 40%. And um, you have higher rates, for example, in Peru and Bolivia at around 60%. And that, of course, reflects a lower rate of urbanization in those countries with more women still working in agriculture. But gaining an income... <coughs> is an important step towards women's greater autonomy, but it's a problematic indicator of progress for several re re reasons. Um, the entry of more women into employment in Latin America actually reflects a decline in the value of waged work. So whereas one wage in the formal sector in the olden days uh, would support a family, it ceased to do so um, in the last 20 years. So you have to have more people, young uh, girls too, actually sometimes going into work, young boys, quite early on in order to sustain the household income. Um, we also have the problems of fragmentation of employment, growth in the informal economy, all of which have pushed incomes down. And a second question is the type of employment. In much of Latin America, the majority of women are in uh, precarious informal employment, in markets, uh, in low uh, productivity jobs and service sector, 30% of economically active women are in unpaid family labor, and a good portion of those don't control the income they generate entirely. Informal sector workers lack social rights um, and have very, very precarious um, conditions and terms. And so uh, we have to be a little bit careful when we say it's a good thing that women are entering into employment without uh, some of these qualifications. And of course, today in Latin America, um, we still have the biggest employer of women as the domestic, is domestic work. There are around 12 million domestic workers in Latin America, 90% or more uh, of whom are women, and um, roughly 15% of economically active girls and women are domestics. Um, and many of those are from racial and ethnic minorities. So um, this is a very, very oppressed sector, the domestic service sector. Uh, pay for domestics is legally allowed to be less than the minimum wage, and only a handful of countries grant domestic workers the same rights as other workers as far as salary, benefits, and working hours are concerned. So it's difficult to get those things changed, and domestic workers need very powerful allies if they're going to gain their rights. Interestingly, in Bolivia, um, domestic workers allied with um, indigenous uh, rights movements to gain, uh, to gain access to their rights, framing the issue as an indigenous rights issue because so many domestic workers were indigenous women. So we have the usual problems then in Latin America of gender segregation, women going into women-only jobs, less well-paid, and so on and so forth. And the pay gap in Latin America is extremely wide, 
um, minimum 40%, and some countries reaching between 60 and 70% uh, because of this gender segregation in employment. Markets, as we all know, do not function perfectly, and uh, markets are very sticky when it comes to gender. Also, quick point, discrimination against women shows up in the fact that women systematically fail to get jobs commensurate with their educational level. So employed women's qualifications tend to be higher than men's, and educated women earn only around 72% of men's hourly income. These are all figures taken from the latest uh, report uh, by CEPAL, which is the regional UN agency. So machismo is still a system of masculine privilege in many areas of social life. Um, and of course, as everywhere else, the invisible constraints of care. Uh, the work of the care economy is also something that is borne largely by women. And all the statistics show there's been very little alteration um, of the division of labor for care and um, domestic work in the home. Democratic representation of women um, has been some kind of success in Latin America. Um, the average figure um, for women in parliaments is 25%, and that's a 2013 figure. Better than the UK, by the way, at 22%. Um, and, um, so, and way down at the lower end of, uh, of this, funnily enough, is Brazil, which has got a quite a strong women's movement. Brazil has only 80%. And at the top end, we have Cuba and Nicaragua at 49 and 40% representation of women. Um, so huge disparities again. Um, but an interesting development is the, um, is the advent of indigenous women into politics. I had this slide up here just to point out that there has been a, uh, an early shift in the number of women in parliament as a result of quotas that were adopted widely um, in Latin America. And you can just see uh, a significant increase in just those three countries. Um, so I think the, the, this is a, a very nice slide of some indigenous women in parliament, in Eva Morales's parliament, um, Eva Morales being the um, president of uh, Bolivia. He's a former coca grower. And he brought a lot of indigenous women into parliament. So uh, Bolivia now has um, an overall percentage of women representatives of 24%, a bit more than the UK. And that happens to be the average for the Americas as a whole. And the world average, of course, for women in parliament is 21%. Uh, yet, of course, 21% is not very much. It's only a quarter of seats taken up by women. But attitudes are certainly changing in Latin America. And um, there is indeed you know, evidence from polls that people are quite well disposed to women serving in positions of power. Although they want a, a president to be a man, they actually trust women more in government, which is quite interesting. Six, since 2000, six women have served as presidents. Uh, most recently re-elected is Michelle Bachelet of Chile, feminist former president. Uh, of Chile, who in a previous administration also served as Minister of Defense. She headed up UN Women until uh, last year when she resigned to stand in the elections, and she's about to be sworn in. Now, apart from, I think I'm going to have to sort of wrap up pretty quickly here, but I just want to point out two very quick things. Um, MDG, the first MDG was the one that achieved the greatest global consensus uh, from across the world, and that was poverty reduction. And in, on that score, as I mentioned before, um, there has been significant progress, and that is because Latin America brought in these anti-poverty programs, cash transfers, they're called, because they give cash directly to poor people, and they give the cash directly into the hands of women. Here is um, a, a, a number of women queuing for the cash transfer, uh, and it has made some difference, as I mentioned before. So I think if we look at the positive results on poverty reduction, um, you can see that there has been a significant fall in Latin America. But I think, again, we have to sort of hedge that by saying that 80 million people in Latin America, uh, half in Brazil and Mexico, two rich countries, are still in extreme poverty. Right? So a long way to go. Uh, these are World Bank figures, as it says there. 
Um, so one of the development goals that failed to make much impact was maternal, cutting down maternal mortality, which is the fifth goal. And uh, that's been the case worldwide. Just want you to look at the middle bar there, goal five. And you can see for three poor countries, uh, we still have very high rates of maternal mortality. Um, that hasn't come down a great deal since these figures were collected, but um, there have been a few more efforts to, um, to improve on that. So I think certainly research that I did showed that women in these very poor indigenous communities in these three countries were very distrustful of the services on, on offer. They did not like going to the central services. They preferred their traditional birth attendants. And they suffered a great deal of racism from the service providers, which had not been tackled, despite a great deal of fine language being spoken by um, you know, various representatives of the government that uh, we were taking these issues very seriously. It hadn't reached the people right at the bottom, and uh, it's always very difficult to do so, but more effort definitely needs to be made. The other area that is very um, lacking is, of course, proper attention to reproductive rights and sexual rights, um, huge problems with um, risky terminations of unwanted pregnancy in Latin America. Uh, one source uh, says something like 4 million risky abortions are carried out in Latin America, and there are significant gaps in provision, as I mentioned before, of contraceptives. So these are very, very serious uh, unmet needs and cause a great deal of um, health problems. So moving then on to um, the post-2015 development agenda, will it do better in tackling the remaining gaps in provision? The last two years has been a, a lot of um, discussion um, in very high gear about what the next set of goals are going to be. And um, there's been a global consultation uh, with really, I mean, thousands and thousands of uh, NGOs and, and civil society actors and organizations. And the global consensus has emerged, um, which had some top priorities, uh, eradicate extreme poverty again, establish social protection, and tackle good governance and accountability. These are the top priorities. And it's not surprising as these things moved up the agenda, given the very um, uh, striking sort of uh, emergence of the um, Arab Spring and the enormous number of anti-corruption movements across the world. Uh, it's definitely felt that these issues can no longer be postponed and um, these are therefore going to be in the new um, MDG agenda. Um, the draft proposal for post-2015 um, has made these commitments that um, they need to go beyond the earlier ones. They're going to tackle some of these issues of inclusive growth that were ignored before, good governance, uh, conflict and violence. They're all very vague. And so until we know what the targets are going to be, it's not going to say very much. But at least some of these things are on the agenda. On women, um, those are the actual proposed goals that have been um, agreed in the uh, the latest document produced by the high-level committee I mentioned, on which David Cameron sits. And uh, these are the goals that will now replace the old uh, MDG goals or carry them on, as in the case of poverty. And you can see that the second one is about women. Uh, in, again, empower girls. And the targets are going to be um, include violence, uh, eliminating violence, end child marriage, and so forth. Violence, of course, is a huge problem in Latin America. Latin America counts for 30% of um, all homicides. Uh, in Mexico alone, more than 60,000 deaths to do with narco violence, and the very ugly phenomenon of the femicides, uh, which have been attacks, um, brutal attacks on women, murders of fairly large numbers of women in countries like Mexico and Guatemala. So uh, you can see that there's still an enormous amount to be done. Um, but, you know, there has been a little bit of progress, but my wrap-up point would be that ultimately progress for women is contingent on a much bigger issue, uh, one that affects everyone and goes beyond any specific targets that might be included, and it concerns what development model will governments and development agencies pursue. The Millennium Development Goals hint 
uh, at some of these bigger issues, but it's still an open question as to whether the post-2015 development framework will really uh, be enough to get governments to tackle central issues such as inequality, environmental sustainability, informal labour markets, and the lack of rule of law, and of course rights for the majority populations. Uh, popular protests in Brazil, Chile, and elsewhere show that there are uh, a number of these questions already in the minds of large numbers of people, and that this question is being posed very directly uh, even now in Latin America by populations whose patience with the development model they have is fast running out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to make room for our students, so there's no time for question today. But uh, I hope this enticed you to learn more about Latin America and perhaps contact Professor Maxine Molino if you have any pointed questions for her. Thank you all for being here. Sorry. <laughs>